Good morning. I'm Rachel Diller. I lost my voice this morning, so the good news is that I'm moderating um, and will say m very little. Um, but um, it's great to be back on Columbia's campus. I'm an alum of the business school um, where I studied real estate finance, and I um, have been an adjunct professor actually teaching social impact real estate finance in the business school for several years. So it's lovely to be back here. Um, we're here today to talk about um, how we use capital for good in affordable housing. Um, capital in real estate, when people think how do you kind of impact places and people, uh, through real estate people always think about affordable housing. I have a lot of thoughts on how you can go beyond affordable housing, um, but we have um, unfortunately been continuing to struggle with the issue of affordability in this country and at a very acute moment in the, stat in the state of affairs here in New York City. And so um, we have an amazing panel uh, today who's gonna talk about first, give us a sense of what the state of the problem is, what the dimensions and the contours are, and then we wanna very much get to what potential solutions are and hope to have a lively debate about that. So um, that is gonna be our format. I'd like to first ask each of the panelists to um, introduce themselves, give them a brief give themselves a brief description of their experience, and then we'll jump into questions. So, Councilman. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, buenos dias, everyone. My name is Carlos Menchaca, city council member from Brooklyn. It took me a while to get here on the bus. Uh, on the bus. I took a ferry, I walked, and the train. So I took a nap in the middle of all that. I represent Red Hook and Sunset Park, a uh, pretty diverse community. Um, over 50% are foreign-born residents and a lot of families, a working waterfront, and uh, we have some things to say about affordability uh, that I, I'll talk about. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Steve Mott. I'm the chief of staff at Help USA. Uh, I've been there for about eight years. Uh, before that, I went to business school, but not this one, um, so I apologize for that. Um, and before that, I worked on Capitol Hill for a senator from Rhode Island. Um, Help USA, just to give you a little bit of background, is one of the biggest homeless service organizations in New York City. So we run homeless shelters, homelessness prevention work, and then we have an arm that does um, low-income housing development and management. So I sort of um, scan the breadth of the problem, and I'm excited to talk about it. Good morning. Um, my name is Matt Murphy. I'm the executive director at NYU Furman Center. Uh, we're a joint research center at, uh, between the NYU School of Law and the School of Public Service, the uh, Wagner School. Um, I'm an alum of there um, and uh, for urban planning. Uh, after that, I worked at the city's uh, housing finance agency, New York City Housing Development Corporation, uh, working on affordable housing policy and deals, and then moved over to uh, HPD, which is a another form of the city, uh, the actual city of New York, uh, the basically the agency that does affordable housing investments, um, planning, and um, I was a deputy commissioner for policy and strategy there. Terrific. Okay, so I think as you can see, we have pers three distinct perspectives. We have a political perspective, we have a practitioner perspective, and we have a policy perspective. Um, and so we look forward to hearing um, from, from each of those. But Matt, let me, let me start with you. What is the state of the affordable housing crisis in New York City today? And can you provide a breakdown of the housing stock and insight to the scale of issues we have in New York City today? Yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'll say too that I, this is an amazing panel. So I'm really happy to be on it. And Rachel's amazing uh, as well. So um, I'll just keep saying amazing. <laughs> The uh, scale of the crisis is amazing. Um, so, um, it, it, I mean, it, it really is. Um, so just to give some top lines, the, the city has done a, a survey for 60 years almost uh, called the Housing and Vacancy Survey. And every three years, there's a sample of about 20,000 households in the, um, in the city. And it gives us some insight uh, beyond what the census does into the housing conditions. Um, the main thing that uh, we we look at um, to, to understand our affordable housing crisis is our vacancy rate. And vacancy rate is just the rate of units that are available to be rented um, but are vacant at a given time. And this rate has been under 5%, which has put us in actually a statutorily defined emergency uh, since like World War II. So our crisis has been 
like a 60 year crisis. Um, but that doesn't mean that we aren't feeling um, kind of acute forms of that in different ways um, as generations change. Our current vacancy rate is about 3.6%. So I like to say it as 36 out of 1,000 apartments are available for rent at a given time. But it, that doesn't tell you the whole story. The vacancy rate at the higher end of the market, units that rent over about $2,500, is higher. It's over 5%. The vacancy rate for units that rent under $800 is 0.9%. So it's 9 out of 1,000. And that's in like public housing, basically. It's a little bit less. So basically, the crisis is multidimensional, um, but we have an acute housing shortage um, in the rental market. New York City is a city of renters. We're two-thirds renters and the inverse of the rest of the country. So a lot of policy for the national housing policy is geared towards home ownership. Uh, New York City is kind of the inverse of that. Um, and so, and you, you see it, I bet we have a lot of renters in the room. Um, and it's, it's what you do to move into New York City, it's what you do to stay, um, and that's what we are. So in terms of that though, there's about three and a half million housing units in the city, two thirds are rental, half of those are rent regulated. So that means we have about a million rent regulated apartments in the city, um, and the, the remaining are a form of either unregulated units, or we also have public housing, which is about 175,000 units, which the scale of that is magnificent. So, and then in our home ownership market, we also have a mix of single family owned homes or one to three type owned homes, which I think Councilman Menchaca has a lot of housing stock diversity in his district. Um, but then you also have cooperative ownership and condo ownership. So we have a lot of forms of housing um, and all elements of them, we probably don't have enough um, and so, and then you layer on poverty, um, and we have a pretty high poverty rate, you have things like homeless shelter uh, census increases over the last, t you know, 10, 15 years, um, and as people are kind of crunched out. So we are a unique housing market, um, and as a result, we have a lot of unique tools to try to address them. Terrific, Matt, thank you. Um, Carlos, take us to the neighborhood level and help us understand the need for and condition for affordable housing in your district um, and the communities you represent. Uh, thank you for that. And the way that I think I want to inject the, the kind of community voice, uh, I just told you that Sensor Park is incredibly diverse. You have foreign-born population making a pretty significant component of it. Um, not all of them are are from one immigrant background. We have Chinese, about 35% Chinese families, uh, Latino families. And so really part of the question about community capital is about organizing. And a lot of that work uh, is so difficult to do that I think it's important for everyone in this room to know as, as y and if you're a student and in business school and that so much of what I'm hoping you get out of this panel is that as diverse and and crazy as the market is here, the real place to start when you wanna offer solutions to the community is with the community at the table. And when you look at homeless shelters and the question around homeless shelters and the policy um, solutions in a neighborhood like Sunset Park where they're taking over, the city is taking over hotels to what I will call warehousing them in hotels without a lot of services, you have a community that just immediately reacts negatively and shuts down conversation. And so then you don't have those conversations about, about affordability um, and because the, the trust is gone. And so this is something that I think, I think is, miss, is missed in the conversation about policy coming in. The mayor wants to build his way out of the housing crisis and when you look at Sunset Park where there aren't many spaces to build and question the question of what do we build with vacant land and the community comes back and says we want schools. We're now building 20, um, well, seven schools total in the district uh, 
And that was because the community came together and said, this is what we want to organize around. So this is, this is really a, a, a big problem for us in communities that want to reject policies or land use decisions because they're not at the table. And I think this is an important part of the conversation to, to, uh, to talk about. We do have a really diverse uh, housing stock. We have this, the, the largest public housing in District 38, in Red Hook, Red Hook East and West, and the second largest in the city. And then you have all this uh, regulated um, federal uh, project-based Section 8 housing in, in Sunset Park. And what's happening there is really interesting because the market is getting, is, is getting to a point where it will one day very soon become more profitable for those project-based Section 8 housing to flip into market. And that's hundreds of apartments that will overnight become market. And that's going to displace en masse people in Sunset Park. So we have, a, we have a big problem. And the one thing that can help all of this is if the community can be organized. And that's a struggle right now because they don't trust government. Um, thank you. That's a, there's a lot to unpack there. And so um, we're going to come back to a lot of it. <coughs> You know, most importantly, this question of can we build our way out of it, right? Can we just add more supply? If so, where do we add it in the market? Um, and then, you know, something that the councilman was describing, which is the fact that every day, every week, every month, we are losing affordability, right? Through obsolescence, through market changes that incentivize, you know, private landlords to take things out of regulation. Um, so we will come back to a lot of the, and then try to unpack a lot of the things that you just talked about. Um, Steve, though, I want you first to, to talk to us a little bit about a homelessness. Um, you know, homelessness, I started my career working for the city of New York, developing homeless shelters. At least the way I always think about homelessness is it's a very interdisciplinary problem. Um, housing affordability is one piece of the problem. But help us understand today in New York City why homelessness is on the rise and how it relates to affordable housing. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. I could talk about homelessness for the rest of the panel, um, but I don't think anyone wants to hear about that. Um, so New York City has the worst homeless problem in the entire country. Um, a lot of people think about Los Angeles or San Francisco as sort of the headquarters of homelessness. Uh, right now in the city's DHS system, there's 59,000 homeless people who slept in a shelter last night. Um, so that doesn't count probably another 10,000 who sleep in non-DHS shelters, and then there's another between three and 6,000 who sleep on the street every night. Um, so that's a big problem, that's a lot of people. Um, you know, it's funny, Matt was talking about inverses, and the reason that people talk a lot about Los Angeles, Los Angeles has 50,000 homeless people. Um, the reason people talk about Los Angeles a lot is about 75% of them are unsheltered. So if you go to Los Angeles, you see tent cities, you see people sleeping on the streets. In New York, you don't see that as much. Now, over the last three to four years, there's been a rise in that, and people say, well, homelessness has gotten so bad, there's so much problem here in New York. The truth is you're seeing maybe 5% of the homeless people on a given day. Um, the other thing that I think is important to remember about homelessness is that there are 60,000 people who are sleeping in shelter tonight, but more like 120 or 130,000 people experience homelessness in a given year. Um, so there are people who bounce in and out of homeless shelter, people who are living in their cars, people who are living doubled up. You add that number up and you get upwards of 200,000 people who either experienced homelessness, came close to homelessness, were evicted, and didn't quite get out of housing court. So the problem is really massive, and it, it's hidden under the shelter system. Now, the shelter system is a wonderful thing, right? It means that families with children aren't sleeping under bridges in New York City. It, it's, it's a phenomenal bit of public policy that happened in the late 70s, um, and I think it's one of the things that makes us a great city. But it also means that when we talk about homelessness, it isn't put right in our face, right? There are a few homeless people, and you, you sort of have a sense of what street homeless people look like and who they are. And, and with the tragedy that happened um, in Lower Manhattan this week, you get a sense of the dangers of street homelessness. But the, you know, the hidden homelessness in New York is that two-thirds of the homeless people in shelters are families with children. So there's this huge population in New York City of families with children who can't afford a place to live. And in the family system, the average length of stay is 12 to 14 months. So if you're a child and you move into a homeless shelter when you're two, you've lived half your life in that homeless shelter by the time you leave. Um, so as a community and as an organization, one of the things that we have to reckon with is, that, you know, and I can talk later about the causes of homelessness and, and why people become homeless, but you, know, you have these people in these moments of their lives where they're so vulnerable, living in homeless shelters. And, and the question is, is the city, is everybody doing enough that, to do 
to help people in these moments that are so crucial for their development. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I was thinking about how, <coughs> not sure how much knowledge people have about what we mean by affordability, right? What we mean by affordable housing. Um, <coughs> you know, the federal standard is that you shouldn't be paying more than 30% of your gross income on housing and housing related expenses, so utilities. Mm. Anything over that, you're rent burdened. And if you're doing quick math in your mind, mm. I would imagine that a lot of you are saying, uh, uh, I'm rent burdened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and you are. Um, I think one of the things that, and we're kind of used to that as New Yorkers, but one of the things that you have to think about is it, it, you're paying 30, 40, 50% of what? On a nominal basis, on an absolute basis, what is left, right? And so when you think about the vulnerability, people who, have, who are housing insecure, mm -hmm. you really are thinking about you know, you know, we call it kind of like the, the flat tire, although people don't drive in the, you know, the, I don't know, <laughs> the busted, busted refrigerator, you know, problem where you're just one small life normal bump away from really throwing the whole thing out of, out of kilter. So this is an issue that is pervasive in New York, but really acute in terms of its ramifications for people who are at, at you know, lower income levels. Um, <coughs> so we've talked a lot, this is about capital for good. So we're talking about all these problems, we're depressing you, how are we gonna solve it? Well, um, mm. hopefully we have some tools. So Matt, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the financing tools that are available to build and preserve housing today? Can yeah, you absolutely, and I will, I will uh, provide a disclaimer that I won't say this is, what I'm about to describe is enough, but I will say kind of where we are, um, and as, as Rachel mentioned, um, you know, there are federal, we, we fit in a federal landscape. So first thing to keep in mind is uh, the biggest driver of uh, low income housing development in the country today is what's called the low income housing tax credit. And this was a form of a tax credit created in 1986 um, that was, uh, I guess I would call a response to um, a longer history of the way we financed public housing um, in the coming out of World War II, where there were grants given to cities um, and to their housing authorities to build housing. Um, and the Low Income Housing Tax Credit basically came along as kind of a smallly <laughs> written clause that said, okay, we'll give you um, uh, 10 years of tax breaks if you pay us up front to help develop low income housing. And that was basically it. And now this is, um, as we've torn down public housing in the country, uh, low income housing tax credit has dramatically expanded. Um, so this is our major um, capital that comes to the table. It's a federal tax benefit. It reduces federal tax expenditures. Um, and the purchasers of these tax credits are actually, uh, tend to be big corporations um, who are getting dollar for dollar reductions off of their taxes. Um, and the exchange is that you have money going to nonprofit developers, for-profit developers, um, who are combining this tax credit with uh, money debt that get helps get developments built. So we as a country don't expend nearly the amount that we have we expend on home ownership policy um, towards the tax credit, but this is how a, a major form of capital. When you combine that with other forms, um, the, the first thing to keep in mind is that, again, at the federal level, there are, uh, there's a special form of tax credit called 4% tax credits that are paired with low-cost bonds or tax-exempt bonds. Uh, these were almost eliminated, actually, in the most recent federal tax reform. There was a lot of lobbying done by the city of New York to, to retain these because we say, hey, um, we spend $2 billion a year using these bonds on low-income housing. How are you going to make us whole otherwise? Um, and they, they kept the clause in. Um, these are the same bonds in other states that are used to finance stadiums. <laughs> so we should all feel proud of <laughs> New Yorkers that we actually use our bonds on multifamily rental housing. Um, but this is a major driver um, of uh, capital. And again, this capital is paired with debt uh, to help get developments built. So these are, these are the major ones. At a local level, we are putting in capital, like literally called city capital. It's capital funding. Um, 
that is designated as basically no to low cost debt that helps bring down the cost of um, borrowing for these deals because with affordable housing, you still need to see returns. You still need to see a, s a property um, uh, operate over the very long run and feel confident in that in order to make the massive investment we make. So there's a lot of debt that goes into these properties um, and then the equity comes through in the form of tax credits. Um, and what this all does is ad add additional supply for these uh, for these low cost rents, the other piece, two main, uh, two important other local components are um, tax exemptions. So we have a really weird property tax system in New York City, which is a completely different day to talk about. But we end up um, giving a break on property taxes if you give us affordable housing in return, um, and so this helps lower the cost of borrowing as well um, because it lowers operating costs. Um, but it's a major kind of shadow subsidy that's put into deals, um, and so it's additional capital. Uh, and then the last piece is actually not real money, um, but I like to include it because it's things like zoning bonuses, where we say if you, you can build a little bit more um, if you provide affordable housing. Um, you, uh, it will change your zoning, um, and Councilmember Menchaca is going through this, will change your zoning um, from industrial or manufacturing to residential, but if we do that, you're required to build 25% affordable housing. So it's creating value that's not in the form of necessarily kind of direct capital, but there's such tremendous value that you can capitalize it into affordable housing. Right, and, and Steve, I want to see if you wanted to add anything here, but <coughs> all forms of, of, so we talked, to, we said, okay, what, what is this capital? You're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, you're talking about government subsidy that is a supply side subsidy. So it's reducing the cost mm -hmm. to build and or finance housing so that you can rent to people at lower rents, right? Because why, why do developers not build affordable housing? Do they just hate people, <laughs> right? Some of them. Some, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a different panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <coughs> because it doesn't, pay, it's not, there's no, th the market doesn't bear that, right? So if you think about what does it cost to build a building, there's land, okay? We have a scarcity of it in New York, okay? Um, particularly in places like Manhattan, it's an island. Um, then there's the cost of construction and labor. Again, very expensive. So when investors invest, they're looking, they need to charge rents that can cover those costs, cover the cost of debt, and to Matt's point, provide a reasonable return. Affordable housing is going in and saying, listen, I am renting, not just renting to people of certain incomes, but I'm not gonna charge them more than 30% of their income on rent. So you're capping your rent. You're capping your cash flows. So in order to make those numbers work, you have to reduce the cost to build. And so you need federal subsidy to do that. And you need, and then there's federal subsidy, and then you talked about the other types of subsidies, and it's not just in New York, but if you can give a property tax abatement, you can get there. Um, you know, there's demand side subsidies as well, which we probably don't have that much time to go into, but are really important as well, where you give them to tenants, right, to the folks who are, and, and that is a voucher for their rents, right? So that's another, another way to go. But m the ma vast majority of capital that's used to build affordable housing is tied to, if not fully sourced by, some government subsidy. I think the exception certainly is the corporations, as you heard, who, as a result of the subsidy, they're private, who are incentivized to get a tax break to invest in affordable housing. This is very positive. This is not a, this is my view. Mm. This is not a bad thing. Some people just say, why are you giving them, using the tax code to give a subsidy? Just cut a check to the developer. Why are you gonna pass it through the hands and all the, attor the attorneys in the room, accountants, hmm. you know, it's a full employment law act, but, Having, in my view, having stakeholders across public and private invested in the long-term viability of housing is really important because building it to be affordable is one thing; keeping it affordable is another. So, th this is these are kind of um, kind of the standard sources of capital, and um, you know certainly there's a desire to, and uh, hopefully, if we have a time at the end, we can talk about the role, hopefully over time, of, of for private capital. Anything else on the financial? Can I add something? Please. Um, 
So we develop a lot of low-income housing, and we use almost exclusively uh, low-income housing tax credits. Um, and like Matt said, you basically pile up a bunch of credits, you sell them to a bank, the bank gives you the money up front, and you build the building. Um, you know, the two interesting things about that. One is when you talk about demand-side um, subsidies, one of the things that we can do is if we can tie demand-side subsidies to a project, so if we say these Section 8 vouchers don't walk away with you when you leave the unit, they're tied to the unit, then you can leverage debt on top of that because it's an income stream. So a lot of our buildings have a portion of the capital that's paid for by leveraging private debt on top of income stream that comes from Section 8. So that's one interesting thing that maybe is too far in the weeds. Um, mm. The other thing that's interesting is when you think about New York City specifically, um, New York City is just astronomically expensive to develop low-income housing. It's, the numbers are just stupid. Um, and so we do work in Philadelphia, we do work in New York City. Uh, we just finished a, an adaptive reuse of an old school building in Philadelphia at 60 units, um, and it cost us $16 million to build those 60 units. Um, we are now just finishing a deal for 57 units in Brooklyn, in East New York, at cost $37 million. So it's almost two and a half times more expensive, three times more expensive to build in New York City for the same units. Um, so it's, it, it, since the tax credits are given out you know, per capita and you can sort of figure it out, but there's something there that like, it's just really, really hard to find enough money to build your way out of this in New York City. That's a great transition. Um, I don't know what time, can you tell me what time it is, Gwen? We still have time. Okay, great. So we've been talking about this, the problem and the scale of it, and I think you have a sense. I wanna try to get to solutions, um, because I think that was the name of the panel. Um, so, um, so I wanna try. So <coughs> just picking off of what, uh, uh, just what Steve was saying, you know, we can't build our way out of the problem, but we know supply is part of the issue. We just don't have enough, right? So is there a supply side market-based solution, not with government, mm. to the affordable housing problem in New York? Why can't we just increase housing density? We talked about that. Let's just build more. It's supply and demand. This is the business school, right? Supply and demand, right? If we build more, there will be, you know, prices will come down and there'll be more affordability. Why, why can't we do that in New York? Or why aren't we, or are we doing that? And, and more, more I, I would like to know, because I like that question too, how much are we talking about in terms of building our way out? Like, are, are, are we talking about another 2,000 units or another million units? And then that we start talking about the scale of that question. Well, I'll give some uh, context. So I mentioned three and a half million housing units. Um, in a good year in New York, we're adding 25,000 new housing units. Um, that's less than 1% of the total stock but also per capita, it actually lags behind San Francisco, which we all kind of point to as like the place where it's really hard to build housing. Um, so there are a lot of regulations that prevent new housing development um, on the construction side. And, and these have, you know, there's a, a merit to the debate of, you know, what's worth it and what's not. It's just recognizing that even with a complete supply-based kind of approach, um, you still are a dense kind of um, land constrained, as Rachel mentioned, city. And as Steve mentioned, the costs are tremendous. Um, and it's not just the costs, it's that you're going to be in it for about 10 to 12 years before the thing gets built, and then you're in it for another 60 or whatever it is. So it's, um, it's just, you know, in terms of kind of our supply-based intervention, like, yes, if we unleashed zoning and, you know, took it down and said, just build whatever, then the market will um, respond and we got rid of red regulation, um, you would see a kind of chaos in the streets <laughs> and you would see a resorting of the population that might lead to, uh, would certainly lead to more housing development and would probably lead to um, a reshuffling of the population. Uh, because we value <laughs> neighborhood diversity, inclusivity, um, the kind of um, uh, choice to stay in a market um, when we provide things like rent regulation, um, the full supply-based solution becomes kind of uh, antagonistic to that type of approach. Um, but it's not, we c if we picture ourselves to be a completely closed off city where we say no new housing development, 
the result would just be that people will continue to outbid lower income renters and push the market further and further out because of our housing shortages further in. I would just s like to mention that in 2010, between 2010 and 2017, um, it's estimated that our population grew about by about 400,000 people. So if you had no new housing development in that time, even with the little bit we're adding per year, where are those 400,000 people going to go? Where are they going to compete for housing? Because New York City is an economic powerhouse and people are migrating here, more so internationally than domestically, but we still have our city of in migrants. So it's just important to kind of keep in mind that we are a growing city. If you close us off, even on the market-based side, those renters will go somewhere and figure out some housing to live in in order to be part of New York. Can I, I want to, I want to just bring that community voice into this conversation because I think, I think that often um, gets ignored in, in the conversations because economics is, is pretty simple to kind of walk through and, and, and I think there's two things that I want to offer in terms of tools and solutions that we have, we have done in Sunset Park. One of them is Google um, Fifth Avenue Committee Sunset Park Library Project. And that's a really fascinating thing where a city-owned property was able to be sold for a dollar to a nonprofit developer. And I think this is, this is another kind of non-market, this is non-profit, but still private, uh, working with the city and rebuilt, is rebuilding, right now it's in construction, rebuilding our library, expanding it by 200%, which is what we needed because uh, that library was one of the more popular libraries in the entire borough of Brooklyn and 49 units of affordable housing with really good AMI spreads and um, affordable forever. And that's where I, I said, I started with affordable forever. I said, we're not gonna do this unless it's affordable forever. And everything kind of came together. It took us five years to put the thing together and I don't know anything about tax credits or how it works, but it worked and it happened. <laughs> and now every council member wants this model in their community, they're like, well, I, we're not spending money on library infrastructure. This is a way to get a new library and affordable housing. So th look that up and you can figure out how that works. I think what's really interesting about those things is that we do not have a lot of property and unless you do re redo the zonings uh, or redo, um, rezone the communities, uh, you're not gonna get those towers and communities don't wanna do towers in their neighborhoods. And, and so there's a question that allows allows us to stop and say, where do, the, where do communities want development? Because I will tell you, communities want development. They just wanna be leading that development. And I think that's, what that, that's where the homelessness issue, I think, <laughs> stops in its tracks and the affordable housing conversation stops. There's two rezonings that are on their way, I won't tell name where and how or what, but uh, they're like MIH, MIH, that's our, that's our answer. That's something that de Blasio what put is, together. What is MIH? Mandatory inclusionary housing, which which is this is where uh, Matt was talking about the bonus. MIH will give you a little bit of a bonus in a rezoning, uh, and with that bonus, they'll give you some affordable, more affordable housing. And so just units. to be clear, so you can build more housing, so build more market rate housing, essentially, <coughs> that will generate good incomes if you have some affordability, and so it's more profitable. So the idea is that the that the market rate housing, the additional incremental market rate housing that you're building, can cross subsidize the affordable. And in my role as council member, I can go back and say, I want 100% affordable forever. And I have that power. And they're like, well, I don't know. We can't do that. Well, then don't come to Sunset Park. Don't buy property in Sunset Park. This is how we do things in Sunset Park. And there's a lot of, that's the role of the city council member and the community coming together and organizing. So I'm hoping you all figure out the, so the kind of financial solutions to make that happen. Because of the third category of stuff that's really exciting in Sunset Park is worker cooperatives are now moving to housing cooperative models. And this is where the home ownership question has just yet to make a splash in New York, New York City. And I think that's the problem here. We're not keeping wealth in communities and essentially developers keep that wealth. And that's the problem here. That's why we're having the issues that we're having and the stabilization in neighborhoods like Sunset Park I is still stable because there have been homeowners. So anyway, that's, I think those are the three kind of categories, uh, Google Fifth Avenue Committee and the Sunset Park Library Project. It's really cool. 
Great, and Steve, I want to turn it to you, but <coughs> I wanted to say that really the connection is you're hearing the huge numbers that we have to develop, right, or preserve to, to have more supply to solve the problem, but the question is where? Where, right? And so easy to run the numbers and say, well, that will give us equilibrium, but at the neighborhood level, right, the question is where, for whom, for how long, and what are the trade-offs? Do you have to trade off affordable housing for a library, right? Um, and so it becomes very, very difficult. And you know, a whole other panel is how things get through public process here um, for changing zoning and land use in New York. And it's meant to have a very um, engaged community process, but there are people on this panel who may or may not agree that that does it to it does justice so you know we really we really have to think about um, not just what we're building but but where yeah we're in the middle of one of those processes and it's um, not easy it's not easy to get stuff built but um, I want to bore everybody by talking about AMI for a second if that's okay um, only if you tell people what it is <laughs> so so AMI is the area median income um, and it's a HUD set level of income that tries to figure out basically how much people make on the median in a city so for a family of four in New York City, it's $100,000. That's the median income in New York City. So um, those of us in the housing development world define people sort of in tranches downwards from area median income. So there's 60%, people who make 60%, people who make 30%. Uh, people who make 30% of area median income uh, come in sort of at one person earning minimum wage. That's, that's the idea of what 30% AMI is. And those are considered ultra low income families. Um, and I'm stealing firm in numbers here, but so in New York City, uh, no, New York State, there are 37 apartments for every 100 ultra low income people. There's 37 apartments that they can afford. So the idea that we don't need to build our way out of this, y you have to build your way out of this. There, there aren't enough places to be. Um, you know, we run family homeless shelters, and one of the things, you, you, know, you can split homelessness up a million ways, but um, an easy way to split it up is that on the family side, it's mostly poverty that brings people into homelessness, and on the single adult side, it's mostly um, mental illness and substance abuse and things like that. So it, that's totally not 100% true, but those are your general pots. Mm -hmm. um, on the family side, we used to be able to find places to place families. So people would hit one of those road bumps, they would have a medical emergency, something would happen, they would lose their apartment, they would stay with us for six months, eight months. Um, we have a whole team of housing people who look for apartments for people, that's their job. They go out into the neighborhoods, they're friends with landlords, they find apartments. Um, and there used to be places in the city where you could find people apartments. Um, you know, and, and when I talked to our housing people, they talked a lot about, well, you could always go to Bushwick, you could always go to the South Bronx, there were pockets of affordability in bed -Stuy. there were places where you could go and set people up and get them an apartment they could afford and set them on a good path. Um, and it's just not true anymore. Uh, you know, when you talk to our housing people, what they say is, people are staying here, they're ready, they have jobs, they're, they're past whatever crisis they were in, but they just can't find a place to live. And so, you know, from our perspective, there, there needs to just be a tremendous amount more put into supply. And so you can have huge arguments about whether you just unleash the supply solution and let everything trickle down and all of a sudden your luxury condos become affordable condos because there's so many of them. Um, but at the end of the day, something has to happen, right? And it, it can be with community, it can be with, with government or whatever, but you can't, you can't sort of do what we're doing right now, which is not develop enough every year on and on. Can I just add, and then I think we're going to go into Q&A, but yeah, I, it's, I, th I, th I would encourage you to think of supply in two aspects. One is an overall housing supply issue that affects the market and the region as a whole. Then you have such a low supply and dwindling supply of the types of units that Steve is talking about. And this is what makes the affordable housing world so complex is the questions Rachel brought up about well, how do you do that then? How do you create those kinds of um, allocation priorities? Where do you add that supply? And also I would reiterate, how do you do that in a way that doesn't exaggerate segregated living patterns? Because there is a history of federal housing policy making that is not good <laughs> um, and is not a good track record. And so you're seeing other jurisdictions actually start to take this on by going so far as eliminating single family zoning in some areas. We don't, uh, um, we don't build a lot of affordable housing in parts of the city, um, and it holds us back when we're looking at these segregation measures. So it's, it's, you have to think of this, I think, comprehensively, and you have to think about the supply issue at these different levels. Great. Um, well, much more to say on all of that, but we would do want to really turn it over to you. This is your panel, and see if there are questions that the panel can answer. Uh, 
Um, I have a question about kind of the thought of not building up and building higher, but essentially building denser by redevelopment. Is that really something that's scalable to um, actually arrive at the amount of supply that's needed, or at some point does building up have to happen in a significant uh, fashion? So, I mean, I can steal it because we're sort of doing a little bit of both of this. We have a project in, in Brooklyn right now that is both um, higher and more dense. Um, so there was a period in the 80s where land um, in parts of Brooklyn wasn't worth very much. Uh, and so we built uh, maybe 150 units of housing on a full city block, which is crazy. Um, and so, you know, we have architects redesigning it that can put those units of housing on a third of the block and add another 350 on the rest of the block. Um, but I there comes a time where you run out of that, right? We have two of those parcels in our entire portfolio and we'll hopefully do them both. And then what do you do? Um, and I think, you know, I think to Matt's point, uh, there are parts of the city that don't want to see anything, right? And so we've got Carlos up here and Carlos is a wonderful person. He's engaged with this community. He's interested in diversity and inclusion. Um, but that's not true of every neighborhood in New York City. Um, and so if you look around, there are people who are not interested in working with nonprofits, are not interested in seeing affordable housing come in, are not interested in moving zoning at all to get this kind of stuff. Um, and so it's, you know, I don't want to single anybody out, but it, 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 it takes everybody in the city to solve this problem that's a whole city problem. I have more questions if you don't, but go ahead. <laughs> Um, my name is Lil Nicholson, and I'm a writer for Harlem World Magazine. And I wonder what lessons have city council people, developers, and as well as we as citizens of New York City learned from the crisis that's taking place with New York City Housing Authority, oh. who built right. affordable housing in the mid-50s that now today in 2019 have plumbing problems. I mean, pipes don't last forever. So we're talking 60 something years later, the windows, the pipes, the elevators, the electrical wiring when it comes to bed bugs. And bed bugs is a problem even in the swankiest locations here in our city. It's just not in, in the lead paint situation. And so as you build this housing, um, what plans do you have in place to actually make sure that this housing can preserve or persevere through the mm -hmm. ages? Because the answer can't always be tear the building down and start all over at the prices that we're at now in 2019. You, I, uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, because Matt probably has a lot more data and statistics, <laughs> but I, I think this is, this is about... Um, Leadership, elections, federal-wise, the federal government has been removing systematically funding for public housing. And I grew up in public housing in Texas, and my my public housing was so bad that they, uh, Hope 6, I don't know if you know about the Hope 6 pro pro program, they demolished them. They were just so infest infested with um, uh, just incredible problems. And I, I, so anyway, federal government is where I think the problem at the root is then you have state and city who have been trying to do our best, and, and we've done our best uh, in some ways in trying to inject some funding, but it's not at the tune of what the federal government, I think, should be doing in the first place. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. I don't know if you wanna add no, that. it's obviously, I think it's just, it's uh, probably the biggest issue in the city today um, on for housing policy is uh, 175,000 units, as I mentioned, the need, the estimated need to repair all the units and put them into good repair is $45 billion. And, and that's, I like to equate that to like, that's what the subway plan costs. So it's kind of like, as Carlos mentioned, this is a federal issue. I mean, we, the city was not able to use Hope 6 um, in the same way other cities did. Um, and it's kept a stock that was actually the first stock, the first hou public housing development in the in the country was built here, um, and it's probably got the same pipes. So you have, um, so you have major quality issues, and and so I would bring this up as well as in when we talk about the supply of affordable housing, 
you know, part of the reason to do that is to improve the quality of, pe of living conditions for people. So what we have in NYCHA is the low estimate is 400,000 people live in NYCHA. The higher estimate is it's more like 600 or 700,000. Um, and they are the residents that earn about average income is about just over $20,000. Um, and and people pay a third of their income in rent, so they're paying rent. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so they're not getting a good deal. Um, and so with the federal kind of drawback, um, actually the f the feds have designed a, a formula to purposefully underfund <laughs> housing authorities. Um, you just have a like year after year these things add up, as you mentioned, and then all of a sudden what could have been a patch is now needs to be a full-on repair, and if that doesn't happen, then the heat is out. So it's important to keep in mind um, that, so what the city has announced is basically a plan to get more capital in, and that's at the federal and local level. And so that's something that needs to be tracked over the next you know, 10, 15 years. But I know that people are really focused on it, and it's gonna take a lot of sacrifice and trade-offs um, by everybody to repair the housing, or that's what it seems from my perch. And, and I'll add that in Red Hook, for example, we have uh, almost half a billion dollars coming in for investment post Sandy. So Sandy destroyed our housing in Red Hook. And we're repairing the roofs, we're bringing new uh, renewable energy alternative. Um, uh, they're getting an incredible makeover. But the qu your question is key. How, do, how's the, how, how is that investment going to continue? Because that's going to require reinvestment over time to keep that new infrastructure uh, sustainable. And, and I don't think we have the answer to that. That's, gonna, that's a, cr cr a quick capital injection. And so I, I, I don't know. And th this is where the federal government, we're going to have to have a whole shift in conversation at the federal government. I'll, I'll have one thing, too, and Steve, piggyback off this. but. This does relate to supply, too, because um, there's a great exhibit at the um, New York City Skyscraper Museum on uh, density and housing, and NYCHA is um, highlighted in it. There are opportunities to build on NYCHA campuses that would generate revenue, and it's highly controversial. People are scared that it will, because of the terrible track record, that it will result in displacement. And that's exactly where we are. I mean, there's literally, that's where the conversation is right now. As uh, you know, so even when we put up, when we say the trade-off is well, build new housing on NYCHA campus and it'll it'll pay for two-thirds of the repairs. There's opposition, um, and it's and it and and that's where the public conversation is. Hi, a um, couple questions to piggyback. Um, when you guys think about affordable housing, is you guys first thought the homeowner just to have a roof over their head, or is it more thinking long-term, meaning? equity, more wealth for that individual. Uh, and then to piggyback on that, uh, you kind of mentioned that for a second. When you think affordable housing and the cap table of that individual making, let's say, 20K and a third going towards rent, what's the, how are they incentivized to get outside of that, let's say, $20,000 range and make more income so that they're no longer in that, you know, maybe good deal, low income kind of regulated apartment? Anyone want to take either one? <laughs> Nobody wants to take the second one, I can assure you. I, mean, I, can, I can talk about the first one. Excellent. <laughs> no, I can talk about both. Um, so, you know, the work that we do doesn't focus a lot on wealth generation through real estate. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people out there that do that. And there are a lot of people that do that in places that aren't New York City where everybody's a renter. Um, and so, you know, we had a project out on Long Island that we bought 50 houses and we had people build equity in them and be allowed to sell them. And, it was moderately successful, but it's just, it, it's almost impossible for us at least under the current regulatory structure to do in New York City. Um, wh when you're talking about creative incentives for people to move out of low income housing, it, it's, it's never something that we focus on. It's not something that we're interested in. It's not, these are not homeless shelters. These are not, um, these are not places where people gradually move their way up. These are places that are affordable for people who make less money. Um, and we think that it's our duty to create those and to serve the people that need those units. Um, and so there's no, we don't push people out. Um, we judge ourselves by how stable our population is. Um, you know, and it's one of the things that if you do the job that we do well, there's not a ton of vacancy in the buildings that you build. Um, so this isn't a step up from shelter to 
um, a condo in the sky or whatever, right? This is, this is a place where real working people live and build lives. What I want to offer really quick uh, is, I think the question has a lot of assumption. And so I want to kind of remove some of those assumptions and offer a different perspective from families that are maybe in, um, engaged in an affordable housing plan and just say, I think there needs to be a mix of affordable housing options and access points for folks. And then two, we haven't even talked about the other side of affordability, which is getting a job that's better and, uh, and access points for communities that are often not able to get those access points because of training. And so that's what we're trying to do in Sunset Park, which is a walk work to walk to work community. And this is why the hundreds of and hun there are hundreds of developers who have bought property in Sunset Park's m manufacturing district that show me towers, shiny towers of housing, um, and I tell them to go away. <laughs> and and um, because that's the workforce center that is promised to Sunset Park, and so part of that is figuring out how we. How we how we solve affordability by just better jobs, and so I think I, I never want to assume that somebody wants to stay in poverty. And what I want to say is, if we give them an opportunity to to actually break away from that, they'll take it. And I think that we need to focus more, and we're not because we're a renter city. But why are we a renter city? Can we not be an owner city? We can do that. We figure it out. I don't know how. I'm not the smartest uh, banker in the world, but we can do that. I want to do that. That takes leadership, and that's where elections matter. And so elect the next mayor to that says that, uh, and let's make that happen. Yeah, yeah and I would just say <coughs> one other thing is that um, we think a lot about housing stability, right? Um, and you know, you think about what it means. I mean, as to be a, if you're a renter and you keep getting bounced around and you're now, now you have to go find a unit and it's not close to your job, right? It's not close to other services. It's not you have kids; they have to move schools. I mean. Just truly think about what it means. I, someone once said, like, one of the top three most stressful things in your life can be moving. Even if you're moving voluntarily, right? But you think about the reverberations and why, yes, there's a lot around jobs and all these things, but why, <coughs> when we think about capital for real estate, do we think about affordability? Really, truly think about the value that home has and place has for its for everything else you're doing in your life. and so even in a renter city where you're not building wealth. Um, stability is so important, and that turnover rate and seeing it low is success, right? And hopefully it's not just because it's the only place you can be, but because community and things are being built around it, and, and the, the wear of that housing is an you know, a an, an community of opportunity, and that's kind of the next step. I, would, I completely agree, and there's a lot of research actually coming out about um, the importance of stability and the kind of, um, and, there, and I would say a trend for the housing world and especially on the capital side um, is tying housing investments more so to things like health investments, um, educational investments. S and you're seeing this, the health industry is actually entering the housing market through affordable housing. Um, and because there's actually evidence that says <laughs> if we can get somebody into a better unit and keep them there, that actually reduces their stress, it reduces their blood pressure, um, and there's definitive evidence on that. So I, I, I think there's a, you know, it's also this where affordable housing is a diverse world. Um, and I would add to that public housing residents have the same, um, uh, basically the same uh, of the working population works equally to the rest of the city. Um, so it's that we have a lot of special populations that are housed there, elderly people, um, you know, people with disabilities. So again, the importance of stability and tying to other investments um, is, is kind of where the housing world ha has been and is still going. I'll, I'll go to you next, don't worry. Um, I'm glad you just said that last thing um, about the health piece. I come from the health world. Um, I worked on the, uh, at the federal government on so the social determinants of health, really <laughs> focused on that idea that your health is more than just you know what you do at the hospital or with your doctor. Um, and we've you know there's a clear link sort of uh, with um, you know poverty and housing affordability and um, and your health outcomes. 
Um, so me as an outsider to this world, and I don't know the specifics of what you guys talked about. We've been talking about it for a long time. In the, in the policy space, I, I ran an addiction clinic where, you know, the number one problem that my patients had was um, their heroin, sure, but it was that they were stuck on the street most of the time, and it was just part of their ecosystem. So as an outsider looking in, um, trying to figure out what all this means and how we can make strategic partnerships here, what would you recommend for people in the health space, or even if you look at the education space, people, uh, when people want to, you know, get better educations for their kids, they move to, they try to move to better neighborhoods. How can we make those cross-sectoral linkages uh, between your very specific housing world and our very specific health world? That's kind of a nebulous question, but. Um, Thank you. That, that um, this is a very big issue. Um, and it, it is an issue that doesn't necessarily just stem from, but is certainly, I don't know what the cause and effect is, it is supported by the streams of capital, right? Back to capital. Um, where the capital for affordable housing is here, for health is here, for, for education is here. And the social determinants of health, and we were touching on this before, and just wanna get back to the where. I mean, one of the greatest determinants of your health outcomes is not just that you have affordable housing, but the neighborhood in which you live. Where is it? What are those neighborhoods of opportunity? And so that's a huge issue. And I think we start, at least I'm seeing on the very local level, I'm part of a board of a national you know, homelessness organization, always used to be housing finance people. And three or four years ago, I was sitting at a board meeting and there was a conversation that went on. We had a bunch of new board members for an hour and afterwards someone said, well, Rachel, what do you think? I was like, I don't understand a word you guys just said and I couldn't be happier. Mm -hmm. Because the acronyms in the healthcare, we had people from insurance companies and folks like that and, and people coming into it. So there's just some work that each of us can do to get across silos, but we have to break it down at the capital level as well. That's the whole story, right? The, um, you need to figure out a way to give some healthcare money to housing people and some housing money to healthcare people. And um, you know, I was on the Hill when the ACA was happening and, and everybody was working towards that and then we all stopped short. Um, but there's, there's a world out there in the future, either five years or 100 years from now, where it's all one unified funding stream. And if housing makes people healthier, then you pay the Medicaid money, right? I mean, that's what it is. And New York sort of did it and other places are sort of doing it, and insurance companies are sort of figuring out that if they're getting a single payment, they could probably build apartments for their people, but um, there's no unified theory yet. Uh, so I would say go work on it. <laughs> and Sunset Park is working on that in concept right now, back to community leading uh, the leadership and the community board. In both CB6 and 7, Red Hook and Sunset Park are both open to creating an, a permanent homeless shelter. And one of the models that we're looking at, and this is where Help USA is actually helping us understand it by teaching the community all the pieces so they can lead, is a ground floor clinic uh, that can be open to a whole bunch of different needs. And so that's an injection of infrastructure that can happen with, with uh, a homeless shelter that can be used by the community as well. So this is where, again, if you ask the community, this is my, uh, my, my, my thing to you, trust them. Uh, when you can get people around a table, they will tell you exactly what they need and how they need it, where, and that's the easiest way. A lot of this is top-down and um, bank-driven, and they can come in. They need to come in, obviously, but after community says and sets the tone. Yeah, and I think <coughs> Carlos mentioned this at the beginning, but we this is about capital for good. We've talked a lot about financial capital, but the community capital is really what makes it happen. You heard, oh, we've got all these tools, but they didn't result in us giving you a really easy, nice solution, right? And it's that intersection that's gonna create the solution, so. I think that's all we have time for, so thank you to our panelists. You. You're terrific. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for coming.